Really what I want to talk to you about is um, what's happened with the digital platform. And of course, I'll try to skew this towards mobile, but definitely keeping in mind that a lot has changed in the entire industry. So this is an eye chart, but what this is really trying to prove is if you go back to 1991 when the web was born, you can see that there was a number of technologies that were introduced, HTML, HTTPS, or actually HTTP first, um, Flash a little bit while later, but for a long time there was very little progress. It was just the same technologies iterating and enhancing themselves. And then when you look at 2008, there was just this explosion of technology, as we all are well aware of, and this cross um, functionality of how those technologies impacted one another. And basically, this is just to say the context of how much has changed in the last five years, and that's why we're all here today. Another way of looking at this is if I had my job since 1991 when I was 12, um, basically, I would have had to be responsible for managing one website. And for 16 years, all I, I would have had to do is update the content, make sure the images were good. There wasn't much about enhancing that website except for maybe accommodating Flash. Then when you fast forward to 2007, the entire world changed. Interesting note here, and we've heard about this a little bit today about mobile becoming ubiquitous, is that Really, for two or three years, a lot of uh, businesses, and especially auto manufacturers, did not have mobile sites. And this was because, initially, people were only really accessing social sites, taking pictures. Um, they were still doing a lot of texting. They were doing a lot of applications. But there wasn't a lot of browsing of websites for the first couple of years. Then what started to happen is a higher tolerance for browsing on devices. Websites increased as people's tolerance for bad mobile sites decreased. And the other thing that happened was people started to get, I think, a little bit lazier. Your tablet was across the room from you, and you didn't go and get it. You pulled your phone out of your pocket because you're just that lazy now. <laughs> All of us are. Um, but as I noted in 2010, iPad debuted. The world changed again for us. What do we do? We had a mobile site, and we had a desktop site. But now what do we do with tablet users? How are they different? What do they want? They're lean back. They're not lean forward. They're not on the go. Really what we found for most of us is let's just take our desktop site and do a few little optimizations to make sure the tablet user is happy. That was OK for a year or two. A lot of people are still doing this. It's not working anymore. Uh, Kindle Fire debuted. iPad Mini debuted. Life got horribly t difficult again. Nexus 7 debuted. People started using the word phablet, and I cried about it. Um, <laughs> but basically what happened, as you can see, this timeline is device proliferation. And how do you handle this from an organizational standpoint? Do you have five different companies or five different code bases? What do you do? Taking another step back to the way we look at web design and what we want from, from our websites. Early sites really were focused on usefulness and usability. They didn't have a chance to be fast because they were on dial-up modems. So they focused on a very small set of information that was very useful and easy to use, easy to find. When Flash was introduced, all the designers went crazy and all of a sudden migrated from print into web because they could do these really cool things with Flash. But all of the standards of usability went out the door and nobody could find anything on websites anymore because there were no standard practices. Mobile came along much later, and everything went back towards usefulness and usability because what happened was they're very small screens. You all know this. Very small screens, hard to, nobody really wanted to scroll at first, and so make it very useful and make it very fast. Tablet changed things in the mobile space because you were able to have something that was more elegant, faster computing speed, so you could do something that was a little bit more elegant um, with keeping speed in mind. As a company, what do we want? We want everything. We want it to be an easy to use, useful site that is extremely sophisticated and it's very, very fast. And this is very hard to accomplish. And there's always pretty much a compromise no matter what solution you're going with. Um, but what we believe in is responsive web design. And, and you all probably know what responsive web design is, but the way I look at this is it's personalization for your device. <laughs> One code base that sniffs out your device and says, I will optimize the content and functionality of our website to make sure you're having an optimal experience from where you're sitting, or walking, or flying. Um, one of the early brands to go with responsive web design was the Boston Globe, and it was talked about for about a year. If you can imagine why they did this, it's really easy to make four columns of print turn into two columns of print, turn into one column of print. And so a lot of the early adopters to a responsive web were blogs and um, 
publishers. Then what happened is all of the skeptics and the organizations had to start paying attention to responsive web because some really content heavy, big functionality sites went responsive. Disney, Starbucks, Barack Obama, and, and nobody could really ignore the fact that, hey, designers and UX teams out there, you can crack this code if somebody else can too. What are we paying you big money for? Um, as far as the trends, and we've seen a lot of these probably already today, um, if you look at the first statistics, for somebody like Mercedes-Benz, that's probably more like 85% because of the kind of people that are shopping for our products um, and their household income and you know, proclivity for technology. As far as um, the important thing for the second statistic is how much has changed between 2010 and today. Um, and that number is just going to continue to grow. And then um, expected growth of tablets. Um, to take this into the very specific automotive realm, some of the things we looked at here was the fact that you know you wouldn't necessarily think that every industry should go mobile, right? Because I can see it for anywhere you'd want to make a purchase that's really common sense. But for automotive, it's a three to six month um, shopping process, and a lot of the processes online are really, really um, some of them are complicated. But people are on mobile. It's just this whole idea. It's just another proof point that everybody's doing everything on mobile. And important for us, they're not just going to cars.com and Edmunds. They're also going to manufacturer sites as much. And if they're only going one place, they're going to the manufacturer website more than anywhere else. This is where it gets a little bit more granular. And this is where maybe it's interesting for me and hopefully interesting for you. This is very predictable. This is what I would have told you people are doing on automotive mobile sites. Special offers I would have thought would be much higher and I would think that build a vehicle would not be on there at all. And this is what I was talking about as far as granular activities. Build process on a website is about five steps with about 75 to 100 options with very complex plausibilities that you have to go between tabs. I don't understand why any of you want to do this, but, but a quarter of you want to. Um, and so we've had to start paying attention and say we have to figure out a way to make um, the build process easy on mobile. And if you look at what's happening right now, everybody's taking a different pr approach. Some people just are letting you choose exterior colors, interior upholsteries. Some manufacturers are choosing to do a full build in mobile. And we'll see kind of where this shakes out. Because what people tell you they want to do and what people actually do are always different. Well, often different. This was another surprise for us. These are what we consider very lower funnel activities. These are things where I would expect, I can see being on the train and doing, you know, looking at pictures, shopping for the car, but when I want to actually um, exchange personal information or do some of these really lower funnel activities, I would do it from a different device. But people are doing it on mobile. Um, taking it very specific to MBUSA.com, this was our share of traffic for about, uh, about a 16 month period. So you can see back in January of 2011, 90% of our traffic came to desktop. And that's when my life was still pretty simple. <laughs> um, and then just a year and a half later, 60% uh, of our traffic was on desktop and 25 uh, mobile 15 tablet. And so don't draw the wrong conclusion here. This, the conclusion to draw is we really, really need to pay attention to tablet and mobile. But if you look at our desktop traffic, which is in blue, it's continually growing steadily. So don't ignore that platform, as has been said before. It's still growing. And the, the cross-device usage is huge. But basically, all of the tablet and mobile traffic is additive. It's not necessarily cannibalizing traffic in other places. Um, this was also very telling for us. In, um, from a one-month sample a year apart, there was a 500% increase of the people who wanted to view more information that was available on our mobile site. So this was before we went responsive. Um, people weren't finding enough information. This is how our responsive class page launched um, in June of this year. The thing that I mandated for our responsive site was that even though we're thinking about mobile first, because that is how we approach the design of the site, it has to be thought of mobile first because it's the hardest uh, platform to design for. It it's, has a lot of restrictions. But it still has to be elegant, beautiful, and it has to have all the functionality possible on our desktop site. And, and I feel like we've accomplished that. If you look at how it transitions to tablet and mobile, um, it still has the elegance, but it, you, we, it has all of the understandings of what that user is used to on that device. So the swiping and the double tap, pinch zoom, 
Um, and then, you know, if you look at the global navigation up there, which I think I get to here, that's the global navigation on our desktop site. And it's all the same code, all of the same functionality, and that's our mobile navigation. So it's broken out in between the kind of typical mobile menu icon and then a vehicle's menu. And, and when brands started to go responsive, there are a, there are a number of mobile vendors who, are, who really um, have an expertise in creating mobile-only experiences off the, by kind of uh, looking at your code and content and, and translating it. They got really mad about responsive because they were starting to be squeezed out of the marketplace. And what they try to tell you is that um, you can't customize mobile experiences through responsive design, and you absolutely can. Um, the other thing that when you look at the sub navigation, dealers and inventory is going to be a little bit more important to somebody on a mobile device because some of them are still on the go. And so we made sure we prioritize that in our menu in a different way than we prioritize on a desktop, but it's still using the same code. Um, this is our, um, our, our vehicle sub menu. You can see it's the exact same navigation, it's just the way you're accessing it is different. Um, there's many ways to to indicate to a user that they should scroll. This kind of cutoff technique is one of them, perhaps um, a little bit more elegant than big arrows that are on each side of the device or the little b the dots you'll see at the bottom of, a, of an image. Um, and then the other thing we did, and this was for maybe a, a number of different reasons, but also with the mobile user in mind, our old site to research a vehicle, the information was spread between seven pages. One of the things that happened with mobile sites and tablet sites is it influenced desktop sites because people got very used to long scrolling pages. Um, and so that became okay on desktop, whereas before we used to talk about the fold as this thing that you couldn't violate. The fold is pretty much going away. People still pay attention to it, but it's, it's not the holy grail that it used to be. Um, so, ooh, I just turned it off. I turned it on. Um, so what? What we did is we turned that entire experience with all of that content into two pages. So it's e easier to find what you're looking for, easier to reference what you're going to. You can also use uh, methods like floating navigation to make sure people don't feel lost on their page. Um, but, but to talk about the benefits from our perspective, um, and this might not be from every brand's perspective, um, better images, and what I mean by that is it's optimized per device. In automotive, there's an arms race for images, so it's really important for images to be as big and rich and optimized as possible. Uh, better customer experience, and this goes to the idea that people are using multiple devices to access your site, and it's really frustrating if they go from your desktop site and then they can't find what they're looking for on their mobile device. You might lose them right there. Um, and with responsive, you, you're forced into that kind of um, great continuous user experience. Faster to market, and this is more personal experience, we would see lags of up to two weeks when we would launch on mobile before. Now everything launches in all places at once. Um, better sharing, and this is more of a, a, a detail, but if you are sharing a URL that's from a desktop site and you email to somebody who opens another mobile device, they're gonna be sent to a bad experience. And this way, the URL is always the same everywhere and optimizes to your device. It's future-proof, um, maybe that's overstating it, but from our opinion, if we start to see a huge amount of traffic coming from PlayStation accessing our website, we add that viewport into the code, we upload some images, and all of a sudden we have a beautiful site where our, our images are full bleed at 42 inches or 60 inches or whatever it is. Likewise, if Google Glass you know, blows up the market and they have, there's a different screen size there, we can also optimize in that direction. Um, and then the last thing is better insights. Um, it's really much easier now to look at how people are behaving on different platforms because they're consuming the same content and, and participating in the same functionality. As far as what I've learned from this process, uh, responsive design is a strategic move. It's not necessarily cost savings. It's not cheap. Um, it, you, there are some efficiencies, but that's not what your, your goal should be if you're trying to present this to some executives. Um, but that doesn't mean you won't gain efficiencies. There's tons that are there, it's, and a lot of them are long tail. They don't happen in the beginning, they happen over time. Um, the world will get more complicated before it gets simpler, um, and that's mostly because it forces you to confront everything you've been ignoring. More from the corporate perspective, you can't lean on your agency anymore because you're, you're, you're focusing on everything at all time while you're planning. Um, 
this will force the issue of initiating a media server solution. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with media servers, but you can Google it. <laughs> um, you can still customize your mobile site when it's responsive. But there's still a place for independent mobile sites. And today has been a really good day to touch on a lot of those use cases. And that has to do with these technologies like iBeacon that are, being, are coming out and Beacon, where location-specific mobile sites really can't be handled as responsive sites because they, they're probably very specific to the person's context and location. And that's not necessarily what this is for. Um, and that phase rollouts will lead to instable metrics for a short time. So don't, don't freak out if you launch a responsive site and it's uh, it doesn't perform outstanding for the first month. It's, it's usually uh, just a matter of time of people adjusting and learning the new behaviors. And I think that's it. Thanks, everybody.